and we are recording. Guess what, folks? It's a Sunday. Yes, it fucking is. Time for a bit of what's up. So, uh, there's the, 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 there's the old saying, uh, things go wrong. I think, what was the fact that, that things go wrong multiple times or some shit like that? I, I don't know. My head's wasted right now. I've had one of those weeks. So, beginning of this week, um, I was setting up to record, you know, the, the, the reviews and stuff. There's been no reviews this week, and here's why. So I was setting up to record the reviews uh, on Sunday, not Sunday evening, Monday morning. Because I've started recording all of uh, the current week's reviews on Monday instead of recording them on the Thursday the week before. That way, if there's any updates going on or news about the item that the company wants out, I've got a better chance of actually catching the news before the review actually goes up. So I was setting I was setting everything up, recording away, recording away, recording away, and it was like, yeah, you know, the little the, the thing, the thing on the little um the the little uh, wireless pack mic that I use. The little VU meter was bouncing up and down like it normally does. And I'm like, yeah, this is brilliant, brilliant. So I went to check the footage. And all, all the sound was basically nothing but white noise. At the very beginning of me moving into the house, which is like, what, six months ago? Maybe seven months ago now? There was some complaints of white noise, hissing noise in the background, but you could still hear me just fine. So what I was doing was I was basically spending about two hours, it was basically two hours, um, with noise cancelling software in Adobe, Adobe Premiere Pro to get rid of that background noise. Well, what's happening now is there's just no voice. There's no me, and it's just hiss all the way through it. It's this thing. Uh, don't get me wrong. They were decent when they actually fucking worked, but, you know, that's this thing. It's it's done. It's gubbed. Absolutely gubbed. So this is uh, the little Cinco G2 that I bought when the Rode Wireless Go Packs decided to pack in. I think I got these about two years ago now. So it's basically, um, where the hell is it? So this is the, the rig that I normally do. This is the transmitter box, right? And the transmitter box is hooked up to the wireless lavalier mic. So this wireless, this little lavalier mic, which basically clips on like that, goes on like that you know and you barely even see it and it's a sennheiser good mic this little sennheiser lavalier mic and it's plugged into the synco so this thing transmits into this and this is plugged in to the camera because the problem is i can't just plug the sennheiser mic directly into the canon camera because it doesn't work the preamp in the canon cam to boost the audio going in, the preamp's not strong enough to handle a Sennheiser mic being plugged directly into the mic jack. So I've been having to use these little wireless packs. Uh, the first one was the Rode Go. That lasted about two years. And then this lasted about two years. They only, they only seem to last for about two years. But yeah, these things are gubbed. Um, so that's why there's been no reviews this week. Uh, I managed to get rid of uh, via facebook marketplace the last of those big standing dome lights from the old studio uh, that sold that 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 got sold in facebook marketplace i think it was midway through last week which came in very handy because the money from that light being sold i've just bought myself a newer n e how do you spell their company name n e e w e r they make really good tripod systems in fact their mics are actually not bad as well so i bought myself a newer um wireless pack for the cameras and that should be arriving on monday and the money from that was from the 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 uh, the, the, the selling of the last of the standing lights from the studio and it actually worked out quite good because I was sitting here thinking how the fuck am I going to get myself another wireless pack there's no way I can fucking afford but yeah turns out that one of the lights sold and I went oh there we go so yeah 
And on top of all that, this thing decided to pack in on me. So I've got two monitors. They're both Asus relatively new air types. They're about, what, three years old? In the grand scheme of things, 27-inch flat screen monitors. This thing decided to pack in on me uh, last Friday. No, in fact, it wasn't last Friday. It was uh, Yeah, it was last Friday. Was it last Thursday or last Friday? I think it might have been Friday it decided to pack in. So what was basically happening was this. Back of each of these flat screen monitors, you've got that, which is the on-screen display. So you can... Oh, fuck. I've just bumped up the refresh rate in the hertz by mistake. Come on. Come on. There we go. I need to go back in there. Come on. Are you going to do it? You've done it, right? So, the little on-screen display thing there, and it just started flashing up and down. It just started popping up constantly, as if somebody was tapping the menu button in the back. It just flash, flash, flash. It was like, fucking seriously? So I've had that monitor for about... That's the first one. I've had that monitor for about three and a half, four years. I've had this one, which you're not seeing, it's off cam. That was the second one I got. And I got that thing about two years ago. So it was spelunker time. Some of you tech people will know what a spelunker is. It's basically a bit of heavy plastic that's about the same thickness as a credit card. And the idea is you work around with the spelunker all the way around the bezel here because these monitors are not screwed together. They're clip-fitted. They're fitted together with lots of clips around the outside. So if you spelunk around the outside edge there with a spelunker, you break the clips open so the whole front panel lifts out. Okay, um, if you vape a lot, and when I say a lot, I mean like me, if you're constantly chain vaping, and your room is constantly on the verge of being completely fogged out, in fact, so much fogged out that you've basically got to leave your window open 24 fucking 7, well, obviously you close it when you go to bed, but the minute you wake up and start vaping, you've got to have your window open to let out some of the fucking vapour. Um, yeah. So I lifted the front panel off, like this bit here, along with the bezel around the side, so it was the back shell, the back case of the monitor was left free. It was swimming in vegetable glycerin. It was almost as if somebody took, like, a pint worth of vegetable glycerin and basically poured it through the top of the monitor. It was swimming in VG inside. Absolutely fucking swimming in it. Everything was coated. The back inside shell of the monitor, the, 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 back, the back metal panel of the actual screen fucking covered in it. It was dripping from the bottom. And I was like, oh, oh. What had basically happened was some of the VG that was dripping from here got its way into these buttons in the back. Now, vegetable glycerin is not inherently conductive. It's not inherently conductive. But if you've got enough VG hanging around a micro switch for long enough, the micro switch is going to start arcing, essentially arcing. It's going to have intermittent contact on and off, on and off, via the thin layer of VG that's covering the membrane film that gives you the click noise when you push a micro switch in. That's what happened here, right here. Fucking swimming in vegetable glycerin. I vape a lot. I fucking chain vape a lot. And these monitors are literally right in front of me, and including this one here. So I'm probably going to have to get this monitor and spill the front off of it. And what I might end up doing is I might end up actually filming it and popping it up on the channel. Vegetable glycerin is not inherently bad for a computer or a monitor. But if enough of it builds up, 
the smaller electronics, like micro switches, for instance, they'll start to suffer. So basically what I did was the little board back there that's got all the buttons on it, all the micro switches, took off all the ribbon cables, a nice bottle of 99.9% .9 isopropyl, and it's got to be 99.9%, .9 the purest isopropyl alcohol that you could possibly get. Not the 80% stuff that's mixed in with water. Why? Because water's bad. You don't want water hanging around a micro switch. This is turning into fucking tech with Vic all of a sudden. You don't want water hanging around a micro switch. So it's got to be 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol. And I basically drowned the board here in the alcohol. Just kept spraying on it. Just kept spraying on it. And I let it dry. Just get rid of all the get rid of all the isopropyl alcohol because if it's 99.9% .9 it dries off very quick. Popped it back in again cleaned up the back shell of the case, cleaned up all the VG dripping off the front panel, shoved it all back together, and it's been working fine ever since. Working fine ever since. The menu system works. The X button there pops up just fine. It's all working fine. So, yeah, I just saved myself... Um, how much were these monitors? I just, I just saved myself another £300, because that's how much these monitors were. Yeah, I know it's expensive, but they've got a, the the the, um, the refresh rate can bump up to 165 hertz, which is very handy if you're doing FPS gaming. Um, so, what I might end up doing is when I take this monitor apart, I might I might end up filming it, just so you can see what I mean. Uh, I mean the same thing goes for the computer, which is sitting right here. So I don't have my computer under the desk. I've got my computer on the desk. And roughly every four months, I've got to take the computer apart. Like, literally strip the whole thing apart. Clean off the glass case because it's literally covered in a thin film of VG. Clean out the filters because it's not only, <clears throat> it's not only choked up with dust. Because the dust is floating, floating around in clouds of VG. The dust essentially hooks onto the VG and basically turns into this goopy, yucky stuff that clogs up the filters of the PC. Um, that's the problem if you vape a lot. If you're doing this, like general mouth to lung like this, if you're doing that, or you've got a pod kit, and that's all you vape. You vape nothing but pod kits or mouth to lung tanks. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Because there's not enough vapour being exhaled to linger around the room. But if you're doing this... Or you've got an RDA, um, Asgard Mini, SL Class Version 2. And I think I've got fluids impeachment in here right now. If you're doing that all the time... Yeah, the vapor's going to hang around. It's going to hang around. Even if you do what I do and you've got a window open with a fan blowing fresh air into the room to displace some of the vapor, that vapor's still going to hang around. And if you're using this type of monitor, the gamer-style flatbed monitor that's got a high refresh rate, these things generate a lot of heat. Heat rises, which means cold air is pulled in from the bottom. The hot air rises from the top, and when it's pulling in the cold air from the bottom, guess what else it's doing? Yeah, it's sucking in all that cloud. So I've had a fucking hellish week, hellish week, just fucking taking, to, taking apart monitors, microphones breaking. It's been a fucking nightmare. But I did save myself over three hundred pound by being able to fix this fucking thing. But it's something to look out for, folks. Uh, mm. If you vape a lot around your computer and you've got a flat screen monitor like I've got and you've had that monitor sitting there for a good couple of years if you don't want to do it find your find your closest geeky friend and get them to spelunk the front panel off I bet the inside of your monitor's covered in vegetable glycerin doesn't take much to clean it one litre bottle of isopropyl alcohol that should do the trick anyway Apart from that, that's, that's basically been it. 
there's been no, there's really been nothing much going on. There's been a because China's back from their uh, New Year holiday. There's been a few bits and pieces that have came in for review, but again, it's mostly basically podcasts. Some new podcast from Aspire was it Aspire that sent that in? Yeah, it is. It is. Got this little fellow in from Aspire, the Flexus Pro. So it looks as if Aspire's updating their podcast line, but. That's been basically it. It's been a couple of podcasts that came in. Um, there was a package that was held in uh, in Stansted Airport for about two weeks at the very beginning of Chinese New Year, and I thought it was going to be a couple of bigger items, but again, it was podcasts. It was podcasts. That's all that seems to be. That's all that seems to be getting released by the bigger companies right now. It's probably going to take a good month and a half roughly speaking, before China gets back into the swing of things and starts it starts dabbling with the bigger stuff. For the people that don't know, Chinese New Year may have ended, but the after effects of Chinese New Year is going to roll on until the beginning of April. For the people that don't know this, what generally tends to happen is everyone in the south, which is where Shenzhen is, right, everyone in the south most of the people that work there, the factory workers, are from the north of China, the rural areas of China, and they all generally tend to fuck off back to their back to their homes, back to their families, because hey, it's Chinese New Year, you want to spend New Year with your family and friends, so they all move north, and there's a mass exodus away from the southern the southern end of China. But here's the thing. Roughly speaking, it depends year on year, but roughly speaking, on average, 70% of those workers don't return back. In other words, they've been working away for the past year, whether it be in Aspire, whether it be in SX Mini, whether it be for Smock, they've been busy working away for the past year, building up the money in their bank account, they've taken all that money, they've went north to go back home, and they're basically spending that money on their family, whether it be upgrading their house, whether it be for gifts for the family, and they've decided they're going to take the next cycle off to help the parents out in their house, which a lot of people end up doing. They help their parents out in the rural communities in the north of China. So after New Year, Smock, Aspire, yeah, for that matter, SX Mini, um, Vapor Esso, all the major companies that have got big factory floors, they're missing 70% of their workforce. On average, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's slightly more, but on average they're missing 70% of their workforce when they come back from Chinese New Year. And it takes about a month to a month and a half to rehire new people to get the factories working at at least 90% capacity. This is why I've always said before Chinese New Year, if you're a vape shop owner, you better get in your coil orders in now and don't order for two weeks worth Chinese New Year. Order for a month, a whole month, because it's going to take about a month from today for the factory floors to start ramping up production to the levels it was at before Chinese New Year. So if you're running out of coils now, Ooh, that's all I'm gonna say. Ooh, <laughs> been okay for the likes of smock. The, the the warehouses have probably got enough smock coils in stock to tide you over until until production ramps up. But if you're talking the smaller companies, like um, Vapefly for the cream healed, uh, for the cream healed mouth to lung, not mouth to lung for the cream healed, or was it the cream healed or Brun healed? stock coil sub ohm tank, the smaller companies with smaller factories. Again, month and a half from today, that's when they're going to be at 100% production. Oh! <laughs> Chinese New Year. Chinese New Year always catches out vape shops. Even today, it catches out a lot of vape shops. The newer vape shops that don't realise that China has their new year based on a lunar cycle, which means it's not based on the, Gregor the Gregorian calendar. Their new year is generally the very end of January or the very beginning of February, depending on the lunar cycle. And it catches a lot of people by surprise. It does. Mm. That, plus the month and a half lag 
for the factories to get new workers in to start ramping up production. It catches a lot of people out, that. It does catch a lot of people out. Where the fuck did that go? Oh, there it is. But apart from that, that's basically it, folks. That's basically it. <sighs> Haven't really been seeing much happening in the way of advocacy. I mean, apparently, vape fly, not vape fly, vape club and UK VIA have approached the UK government. I think it was UK, I think it was Vape Club that did this, sorry, backed up by UK VIA. Apparently, Vape Club approached the government with the idea of a licensing system. What basically myself and a whole bunch of other people have been talking about, they've been talking about, uh, they've been approached the government about a licensing system for vape shops and online vape shops and what, th what I've been hearing um, I don't think it's going to happen. It would have been, it would have been a lot better if instead of one vape shop backed up by UK VIA, who the government, for all intents and purposes, are basically ignoring right now, it would have been better rather than one vape shop and one trade organisation approaching the government, it would have been a lot better for a group of vendors and a group of wholesalers and a group of distributors all approaching the government at the same time with this license system idea because then the government would have said to themselves well you know here's x number of shops x number of wholesalers x number of distributors x number of e-liquid manufacturers all saying to us all together at the same time all independently of each other hey Maybe you should license vape shops. That would have had much more of an impact. Much more of an impact. The uh, the worry I've now got is that the vape shop license idea could have been sunk by Vape Club. That's the worry I've now got. If the UK government was going to have some kind of idea in the future of some kind of license system for UK based vape shops maybe that idea could have been sunk at the doorstep when vape club alone possibly backed up by UK VIA who for all intents and purposes it looks like the UK government is ignoring having that happen it could have sunk the whole idea it could have sunk the whole idea all we can do is basically wait and see that's all we can do would it be better for a licensing system to be implemented in UK vape shops and then have the future possibility of a flavour ban scrapped? Yes, it would. But number one, how much is that licence going to be? Number two, how is the online licence idea that Vape Club come up with, how is that going to impact the smaller independent like one man or two man show, uh, independent va independent online vape shops. Because for, again, from what I've seen and from what I've been hearing, it looks as if vape club basically want to practically put a kibosh on the smaller online only retailers. They basically want to shut them down. And this is the problem that we've got now, because what we've now got and what we are now facing is we are now facing individual larger established shops wading in, trying to bully their way to the front of the queue to get some kind of legislation in place which protects them, but doesn't protect anybody else. This is what happens when the entire industry is caught with its pants down. By the way, I've also invited John Dunn onto the UK Vape Show at any point he wants to come on. And I've also said to him he doesn't have to come on the show himself. He can bring another person from UK VIA if he wants to. Still to receive a reply, but granted, I only sent him the message yesterday. So he might be on holiday or something like that. But I, haven't, I have sent a message to John Dunn if he wants to pop onto the UK vape show, he will not, well, uh, with Aidan and Adam, <laughs> with Aidan and Adam, he will not be sitting 
in a hostile environment. With me, however, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, just the just just the fact, just the fact that the UK vaping industry, as it stands right now, is blind, rudderless, and captainless. That shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. It really shouldn't. But the fact that it is basically says a lot for how the groundwork was laid down for the vaping industry groups. And I'm not just talking about UK VIA here. I'm also talking about the IBVTA. Both of them. The fact that the UK industry is rudderless, captainless, in the middle of a stormy sea is tantamount to the absolute detrimental effect that lack of any action has had, at least over the past year and a half, with the two major trade groups. We shouldn't be in this position right now. What should have happened the week, not the day, the week, to give people time to plan, what should have happened the week that paper dropped from the government at the end of January? UKVIA, the IBVTA, I'm going to ignore NNA because they're dead now, quite frankly. They should have been knocking on the front door of number 10 together. Together. With as many of the industry backing them as they possibly can. Instead, what we have seen is just absolute sheer madness. Individual companies... Big companies at that, but still individual companies coming up with plans to help them survive, but to wipe out smaller individual online shops. Individual companies coming up with plans to save themselves at the expense of vast segments of the rest of the industry. And as for you fucking numpties out there that are saying, oh, 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 all of Vic's videos are nothing but scaremongering, go fuck yourself. Seriously, from the, bottom of my, from the bottom of my heart, go fuck yourself. Because here's the thing, everything I've been saying so far is coming true. There's a difference between scaremongering and telling the fucking truth. Wind your fucking necks in. Because I'm getting fucking fed up of so-called community vapors who care about the community, who are burying their heads in the sand, thinking nothing bad will happen. Guess what? Bad things are already happening. Disposables are going to be gone by next year, and the government is steadfast about the flavour thing. And there's now been reports of some members of parliament on both the Labour Party side and the Conservative Party side that are now saying publicly that the flavour ban is now a done deal. Don't sit there in your fucking armchair playing armchair quarterback saying I'm doing nothing but scaremongering. Why don't you get up off your lazy fucking ass and actually do something to save the fucking community that you're supposed to be supporting? Prick. Anyway. Had to get that rant in there because there's far too many people. I'm not. I'm not just talking about people. I'm talking about vape shops as well who are burying their heads in the sand, thinking nothing bad is going to happen. Guess what? It's already happening. I, I, I just don't know, folks. I don't know. Mm. What I'm going to be doing, and I decided to do this midway through this week well in fact it wasn't it was on friday when it was pulling that fucking thing apart i decided that i'm going to be taking a step back from the whole advocacy thing fuck it why should it be me sticking my neck out time fucking time and time again calling out the trade industry bodies for being asleep at the job why should it be me sticking my neck out time and time again when no one else is doing it publicly as much as i am so you know what fuck it i've had enough I'm going to be taking a step back from advocacy and the only time I'm going to start talking about it again is when something concrete is happening. When something is actually happening on the ground. Because so far, with this whole WhatsApp group that's going on, I haven't heard the fucking thing. I haven't heard the thing. If advocacy is not reaching the ground level, it's not going to work. 
you have got to get ground swell support from the common everyday vapour in order to save your failing industry. If this is going to be another top-down idea like UKVIA has been doing for the past half decade, you're going to fail. It's not you may fail, you are going to fail. Guaranteed. If you don't get the groundswell support from at least 20%, at least 20% of the 4.2-ish million vapours out there, your advocacy is going to fail miserably. Miserably. You need to walk up to number 10 Downing Street with a million people. Well, not a million. Call it 500,000. Yeah, with 500,000 people backing you up. 500,000 people. And that's got to be a mix of industry people. It's got to be a mix of general vapours. It's got to be a mix of vape shop owners, e-liquid manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors, everybody. All lumped into one single group. But if you don't get the ground swell support from the general customer, all you're going to be is another trade organisation trying to save your own bacon and the government will simply ignore you. If anything should be learned from the failings of UKVIA, it's that UKVIA done it from a top-down aspect. They didn't do it from a bottom-up. If you don't work from the ground up, you're not getting the groundswell support. You're not getting the support of the everyday general customer. And without that support, you're nothing but another trade organisation. We've already got two, and they're both being ignored. What, make, what makes you think that your WhatsApp trade organisation group is going to be any different? Because if IBVTA and UKVIA have failed to gain the trust of the UK Parliament, why do you think you can? I'm just asking. Personally, I don't have much of a skin in the vaping industry game. I mean, I'm not like some of these CEOs and directors who are making fucking six-figure six figure sums every year or half a million quid every year. In fact, that is a six-figure sum. What the fuck am I talking about? Is it? Yeah, it is. I'm shit at maths. But I'm not one of these big wig people driving around in fancy fucking cars. I'm sitting here surviving on £1,000 a month. A lot of you people out there, not the general vapour watching this, but the general people in the industry, you're probably making five, ten times that a month. I've got no skin in this game. None at all. And I'm just telling you what I'm seeing from the ground position. From the ground position. When I talk to general everyday vapours on Facebook, practically every day, and just chatting about what's going on. And I'm talking about UK vapors here. They're talking to other UK vapors who are not part of any vape group. Who are not part of any vape community. They're just buying the podcasts from their local shop. And they're buying their little 10 mil bottles of tobacco liquid from their local shop. They have no fucking idea what's happening. None. Literally no idea what's happening. Not the people that are part of Facebook groups who are part of the overarching online vaping community. I'm talking about Joe Bloggs, who's 55 years old, who nips into his local independent vape shop to get a bottle of watermelon 18 milligram Nick salts for his little x -Ross kit. I'm talking about him. I'm talking about Joe Bloggs, another Joe Bloggs, who runs that vape shop who's selling the little 10ml bottle of watermelon Nick Salts to the other Joe Bloggs who's in his mid-50s. Him as a vape shop owner also has no idea what's happening. No idea at all. Until you get the ground support, whatever group is formed will not be able to succeed. I can fucking guarantee you, you will not succeed. You need the ground support. The ground support has got to be there before you approach number 10 Downing Street. 
It's got to be there before you approach the higher up members of parliament. It's got to be there before you even consider approaching the all-party parliamentary group. Because the last thing you want to see when you're sitting at that table in committee with the all-party parliamentary group is you're a trade organisation. You don't want that moniker of trade organisation above your head because the people in the all-party parliamentary group who are against vaping will automatically think you're only here to save your own skin. Now, if you were to walk into the APPG and say you're an advocacy and trade group with advocacy first, that generally entails to the idiots that sit in the APPG, usually from the Labour Party, who are anti-vaping, that you've got some kind of ground support backing. Backing from the general consumer. Once you bring the general consumer into the picture, Labour tends to back off, at least a little bit. They're not as harsh if you've got the backing and support of general consumers. You've got to get support from the consumers first before anything else can happen. There are multitudes of shops out there that simply do not have a fucking clue what's going on. They don't have a clue. And if they don't have a clue, their customers don't have a clue. This is why I said I don't want to run anything like this because this kind of shit is going to take full-time commitment. The kind of commitment that myself neither has the time nor, quite frankly, the inclination to do. Because number one, it's going to be a completely thankless job and number two, you're not going to get paid for it. You're not going to get paid for it. At least the way that most advocacy groups are set up, you're simply not going to get paid for it. Um, this is why it's going to take someone who's got a lot of time and more importantly, a lot of money behind them to basically pick up this baton and start running with it. All we can do is sit back and wait to see if someone picks that baton up. Right now, this WhatsApp group that got formed is probably the best chance of... Pardon me. Uh, probably the best chance of at least putting the brakes on for the government's plan. At least putting the brakes on. We know the disposable ban is going to happen. There's no way that can be rolled back now. There's no way it can be rolled back. The flavour thing, though, if there's a chance of even having the brakes put on, that's a win. That's a win. All we can do now, though, is sit back and simply wait and see. That's all we can do right now. Anyway. That is basically it from me, folks. Um, the new mics will be arriving on Monday morning. And what I'll probably do is I'll do a couple of test runs with the Canon cameras. And if the sound's all, if the sound's all, you know, working, essentially, you can actually hear my fucking voice. Uh, the reviews should be back next week, probably kicking off on Wednesday, because I'll end up recording the reviews on Tuesday instead of Monday. It'll be, it'll be a couple of pod reviews, essentially, because um, I don't think I've got anything bigger. I don't think I do. I keep thinking there's something big, but I don't think there is. No, I think it's all pod kits right now, so a couple of pod kits, maybe a couple of juice reviews thrown in there as well. Anyway, that's it for me, folks. As always, thanks for watching, and if I can find the button, have a good one.